You know, I, I don't think that there's any one day that solidifies it for me. I, yeah. I think there's a certain feeling that everybody that runs a boat or works on a boat enjoys being in the outdoors and enjoys the passion, whether it's the salt there on your face, the wind on the sun on your face, uh, you know, the taste in your mouth, uh, sunglasses on. I, I couldn't explain that for you, but I, I do believe that there's a common bond with any, every waterman on the, on the wor- in the world. Um, I think that's probably what summed it up for me got me up because I was just motivated. Yeah. I liked it. Um, I wanted to be that. And how did it start out? Like, what was the origin story? Too much alcohol. Really? <laughs> okay. Because if God wanted us to have fiberglass boats, he would have given us fiberglass trees. It's it's for fishermen. It's not for taking the wife and the wife's friends. It's, I think that it's a really, really pretty good. And then there was a blur that went by and ended up in the cockpit, as yeah. far as if I can remember uh-huh. correctly. <laughs> uh, welcome to the State of Sport Fishing Podcast. I'm Nick Carullo. I'm with my co-host, Anthony Pino, with Hooked Optics and Captain of the Blood Money. Uh, tonight, our guest is Dean Lambros from the Canyon Runner. Thanks for joining us, Dean. Look forward to uh, chatting. Thanks for having me. This is, this is great. Dean, tell us... Uh, how you started, where you came about, how you got into the industry. Yeah, so I got on the boat when I interviewed. I was, I was 19. I was a sophomore in college. So we here at Fairfield University. It's just a local university here in Connecticut. And um, had the passion of fishing, very into it. Used to fish with my stepdad. Um, grew up fishing, just kind of inshore, that type of thing. And uh, took the interview, got the job, started as like the second mate, bucket scrubber, worked under a handful of the captains there um the nice thing about the canyon runners that they had at that point three boats i think three full-time captains and there's just always an opportunity to do something so i packed my stuff up went down there for the summer and pretty much it i finished up college coming back here in the winters and then was on the, on that boat full-time i think 2011 maybe and uh i started running it the next year just out of necessity i was the next guy in there and uh, i remember the day distinctly it was replacing a toilet, doing an oil change. I can't remember why the captain wasn't there, Captain Mark. And then I got a phone call. Hey, can you run the boat? And I was 22. And so I said, okay, sure. And uh, and that was it. I remember the the inlet was so foggy that day and I was freaking out. I'm like, oh man, this is and then, like, uh, Is there a lot of current where the, the Canadian runners docked or no? Up there. No, it's not as bad as down by the bridge. No, the... It, Matasquan Inlet, I think, is relatively easy. Yeah, yeah. It's just narrow. Yeah. Um, but I just remember saying, like, okay, we're leaving at night in fog. Like, ugh, okay. Yeah. And off we went. And, uh, you know, it worked. It wasn't, I don't, I can't even remember what we caught, but it was enough. But everybody was happy. And so it was just a big relief to me. And then, I don't know, what happened there? I think that was the same year Sandy hit or whatever. And uh, I just basically had, had uh, a place on the wheel since. And that was it. it was did you hard. now? Did you start off fishing before? Obviously, before the Canyon Runner. Did you do any? Did Did you do any sort of that offshore stuff? Yeah, you know, Canyon. Yeah. Like you know, I was fishing with my stepdad, so it was yeah. just like go there, hang out. We catch a handful of fish. It's like, whoa, this is lights out. This is sick. Yeah. Um. Granted, I wish I knew what I knew now then, but. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. No, we did a little bit of that, but it was like, I don't know, maybe three, four times a year. You know, you go to a pot, you catch a dolphin, you think it's the greatest thing in the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I look at some of the photos and I'm like, wow. <laughs> and then, so how'd you get like lined up with them? Did you just send an email or drive down or something? Or like, how, how'd you figure out that you, that was the job that you wanted? And then, and then, you know, like. I would say I just got super lucky and had the right combination of tenacity at the right point. Uh, they were yeah. hiring. I wanted a job. I knew nothing about fishing, nothing about working on boats, nothing about how the industry functioned as a whole. Um, I had no ends, nothing. I just heard these guys go tuna fishing a lot. And that was really it. There's not too many opportunities like that up here. And and around that time, the economy had just completely imploded. So if you were going to go fishing, you probably want to go on a boat that has a lot of trips. Yeah. (laughs) That's well known. Tell, tell us about that schedule, man. I mean, the the freaking the grind on that boat. Uh, your schedule just overall for the season, but in the summers, very few can 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 do that, man. That's what you guys did, especially when you were really hitting the tournament scene hard too. Is pretty pretty amazing. Well, uh, I think I'll use the best analogy someone said to me. He's actually a former Canyon Runner captain. I don't know if you guys had him on here, Decabia, Mark Decabia. But uh, he said, you know, it's really like commercial fishing with people. Mm-hmm. And I guess that's really what it is. Um, 
you know, we, over the years, fishing's changed. It used to be get to the canyon, go fishing at night and do your traveling during the day. But as the fishing's changed, we just adjusted the schedule. And when you learn to think like that, and, and if you can book out a solid 24 to 30 hours, um, you have a lot of flexibility. So we just changed the trip to uh, accommodate the bite. Yeah. The downside to that is you learn, you lose some of the um, novelties of life and the consistency in the schedule. But we basically travel as much as we can, as far as we can, and do what we need to do to produce for the trip. And if that means coming to visit you guys in a poor man's, you've seen me there. If that means yeah. go out east of the fishtails like we were this year, 150 miles from the inlet, that's what we did. Um, in terms of scheduling, whenever we could get a trip in, that made sense. And, and I say that sometimes you're given 30 hours to make a trip, but it doesn't make any sense whether you're going to miss the bike completely, the weather's going to spark up. It's just you're forcing something that shouldn't be forced. And, uh, you know, we've taken some some hits over the years. We've made the wrong call. But more often than not, I like to think that we make the right call. And number one, we want to make sure the charter's having a good time. And I think I think fishing's really evolved. And that charter fishing's entertainment. It's, it's nothing more than that. And when you can think of it in that manner, you're going to be successful with it. And, uh, you know, it's not just me with the schedule, too. The, the guys that work with me, uh, Mike, he's been working with me pretty much exclusively for four years. Um, Kyle was on the boat for a while. Um Doughboy, you know him, Charlie. He was on the boat for a while. We've had a lot of really great fishermen over the years on that boat, and they help a lot too. And it's not just the wheel, you know, just the captains on the wheel. The mates really put a lot of effort in, so that's that that helps a lot. But uh, the schedule is tough. It definitely grinds you out. You learn how to. I mean, what's to, what's your what's your for people that don't know fishing up in the the northeast? Because I mean, it's it's you're a whole different level of fucking nuts than we are in Ocean City. You know, and people like Nick probably thinks we're nuts here in Ocean City. And then explain how your day is, dude. Yeah, I mean, I think we are. You know, <laughs> definitely uh, we're hungry for it we'll put it that way um i think our average run i would say is anywhere from 80 to 110 miles depending on where we need to be and and where the water sets up we're we're really water oriented we're not so much structure oriented um typically our we'll do uh two trips in a row so the first trip we'll leave around midnight we'll get out to the grounds first light we'll fish till dark come in um sort of do an extended turnaround so we're right back at the dock around two three in the morning we offload we cut the fish sleep for a couple hours marina open back up at eight and uh we'll take on fuel ice and bait get the next group off the dock at 10 fish a conventional overnight trip and uh be back at the dock somewhere between 10 a.m and 2 p.m rearm regroup same thing get a little dinner sleep for a few hours and leave again at midnight. And What's the, and, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Try and stay on that schedule. You, every charter has a first light and a last light bite. And it's gotcha. efficient, that's the name of the game. Wow. And how many trips are you doing during that time when you're running trips? This- so we, we, the last couple of years, you know, COVID has been really good for our demographic. It's really compressed it. I mean, I think with everybody in fishing, but uh, we've averaged 62 trips the last two years, both seasons. Um, the weather affects us a lot and we cancel uh, a fair amount of trips. Yeah. Um, but that's a pretty condensed schedule. It's typically, you know, mid June, uh, October, Dean, probably. Yeah. Typically. Yeah. Last class couple of years, we stretched out a bit like middle of May and, yeah. and you mentioned the tournaments and that's the tournaments actually hurt us because you got to block out an X amount of time for the tournament and then you lose the flexibility on either end. So if you have that weather, you can't push the trips into the, that next week and vice versa. So is that with, sorry, is that with the, the owner of the boat or that's chartered out for the tournaments? It's a combination. It's a combination. We've done it with the owner of the boat. We've done it with some, uh, with charters, um, both ways. Got it. Both ways. Yeah. Do you have any preference when it comes to tournaments? You feel like, you know, with the owner, with char- charters, like, you know, I mean, I guess with the owner, you'd have more of a, more of a group of, of, you know, typical, or I guess seasoned, ang- more seasoned anglers, but I'm sure there's some good anglers that charter you too. Yeah. You know, we get some, we get some good, good guys in both ways, you know, charter fishing, we have novice anglers and we have advanced and intermediate. Um, we just try and make do the best we can. And, you know, with the tuna fishing, I don't believe the angler skill set is as important, let's just say, when you're doing a hook tournament, right, where you can't hook in hand or the mate can't compensate for it, or you're doing like a complex billfish tournament or kite fishing or something to that effect. Um, but you need an angler with some stamina. I mean, yeah. you fight a big eye for two and a half hours in 90 degree heat. You want someone that doesn't tell you 10 minutes in that they have a heart problem or they have arthritis <laughs> in their right hand, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you want to vet the angler a little bit. But uh, have, you, have you ever run into that issue, you know, in a tournament? You're driving around over the same spot because I've watched it for anybody who who's never fished up in the in the in the tournaments. And there's a certain handful of, of captains that can drive around in a in a 
in a canyon that has had a bite or had a had a fairly consistent big eye bite during the tournament hours and they can they have the patience which you are an incredibly patient fisherman and you can you have the patience and the wherewithal to get a bite in the middle of a fleet of 60 boats like consistently that that is i i can't comprehend how you do that but then to do that and then to get a bite you know to have somebody like you know, get that bite then to be like, Oh yeah, I have a heart problem. Have you ever run into that? Not a heart problem, but we did have somebody on the boat this summer. We, uh, in the middle of the fleet, we found the big guys up top and we hooked them and <laughs> the angler who was supposed to be our designated angler grabs one rod. And then another guy just grabs it, grabs the rod. And, and we said to him, uh, I guess you're, you're up. He's like, what do you mean? I said, no, you grab the rod, man. You got to stick into it. And we ended up catching a fish really quick, yeah. 15 minutes. You know, they were a pair of 200 pounders, but, uh, <laughs> the guy in the middle of it goes, uh, I don't know if I could do this for much longer. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like, uh, all right, man. <laughs> it is what it is. You know, the charter fishing, that's what you get. You yeah. take your poison, you get a lot of shots, but you can get uh, some varying anglers. And you guys came down to Palm Beach or something too, right? We were in Miami. I had the boat in Miami there, uh, South, what is it, South Beach Marina maybe, one on yeah. the down the right. Um, was it 2016 or so? We were there for a couple of weeks. No, no, a couple of months, really. Um, we didn't do too much fishing, but in years past, the, the owners had the boat there in Miami. You know, various cabins have run it. Yeah, I um, met, uh, that's, I met, that's how I met Mark when down, okay. I guess, down in Miami. Okay, yeah. So those guys were there. Um, you know, I mean, the boat's been around for a while. I think they've had a boat for 37 years. Wow. So, um, you know, they've definitely had it in all sorts of places. When I was running the boat, I pretty much just did the uh, New Jersey, Massachusetts, North Carolina lap with the boat um seemed a little bit better kind of suit my style of fishing i'm more tuna oriented than billfish oriented nice yeah it works i'd love to come see that shit man you gotta come up man not yeah, that that's I'm, cool i'm yeah, big guy that's my favorite eating fish so yeah dean great like i said dean's one of those guys that explain that to me dude because it's part? the whole in the corner of a canyon, whether it be the Wilmington, the, you know, the, the Wilmington, the Washington, one of the bigger canyons, or maybe so, uh, the Hudson or something like that. I've seen it too many times, so it's not a fucking accident, but you're just dri- everybody's driving around in circles and, and it's, you know, you and a handful of other boats that, that got it, got it figured out, dude. You know, I mean, well, I think big eyes are, uh, they're pretty mysterious look- fish. That's for sure. They're mysterious, but, uh, the, you know, I think all pelagics are susceptible creatures of habit. Um, so a friend of mine put it to me that way once and it makes a lot of sense, right? You see the repeat conditions. Um, big guys are definitely the most structure oriented tuna. And, uh, if you can find the right conditions, so you got the right water, good bait over a pretty steep ledge of the Canyon. And we don't have the current, like, um, let's just say in Florida or North Carolina, you, you can pretty much find these repeat patterns. And so the, the Northeast corners of these canyons, the notches, they hold the bait. So that's, and if you can find the, the black pilot whale, the, the, the black fish, it's, that's a, that's an ace way to catch them. You yeah. just got to grind it out and put the time in and uh, you can't leave it. And I've been on both sides of that trade many times where I've left it too soon. And when I was there and, you know, you get some bites, just have to grind it out and it is what it is. It's pretty slow fishing in my opinion, because you're fishing for one bite. Does it frustrate you that you're, you're kind of doing that? Like, you know, I, I guess when you're charter fishing, you, you kind of got to kind of do what you have to do, but to, or in the tournament, especially you have to kind of fish for that one bite, but do, you know, do you, do you get, do you, do you have to talk yourself out of being impatient or, you know, being impatient, I guess? Yeah. A um, couple of things. I, I, I think with all fishing, the, the biggest, the, the key to it is it's not what you're doing. It's all about how you're doing it. And scientifically and factually, it always made sense to me. If you have an edge in some sort of fishery, you should exploit that edge, especially if you have uh, just a little bit faster way to connect the dots than the next guy. Mm -hmm. Um, So I always said that that made sense strategically to put the time in. And I enjoyed that, my personality. I I like thinking about it. I think one of the most challenging aspects of fishing is you have to put those little uh, pieces of information and find those common denominators faster than the next guy. So interpreting that data set, basically, uh, I find that to be rewarding. And uh, when it comes to big eye fishing, I enjoy that type of fishing, even though it's it's totally boring, but uh, you just grind it out. And it is kind of refreshing to know that this is what we're going to do all day. We're just going to stay in this one spot. So if you know there's a beginning and an end to it, you can get yourself through any period of time if you know there's a beginning and an end. Gotcha. That's how I look at it, at least. Yeah. What do you think, Nick? What, I mean, does that does that sort of concept make sense in the convert to the sailfish tournaments down there too? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely times when you just kind of got to 
Stick to it, like he said, you know, I mean, just kind of, it's what you know, and when you got to wait for the condition and it's a matter of time until it lines up and you're going to get the bites, you know? Yeah. Do you guys, like, I, I'm a, I feel like I'm relatively aggressive when I'm, when I'm fishing up here, you know, I feel like I've, I've learned enough about what I'm looking for now, finally. Um, that, you know, if I don't get a feeling of, you know, if I spend, a, you know, 45 minutes, an hour on one spot, if I'm not feeling it, I'm either trolling one direction or I'm picking up and running somewhere, you know, trying to, like you said, Dean, putting, putting that information, do you, do you guys think of it like connecting those dots or is it more of a feeling for, for each of you? You know, like sometimes I just get a feeling like, man, this looks good. And I, it, it's, you know, and I'm going to stay here. And like, sometimes I think about it more, more strategically than that. And sometimes it's more of a, just a, just a gut feeling. What do you, what do you guys think? Do you guys go like, Oh, I'm seeing this, this, and this, or do you just go, man, this, this, this is going to be okay here. Um, well, it's, I think it's a combination of all of it really. It, yeah. I, I think that it, there's an element of going with your gut. You're going to take a stab and you make an educated guess. The advantage of fishing every single day is that you are able to pick up on those little details. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that the number one thing I ever did for myself with the fishing is just start to write things down. And I, it's really my biggest regret of my career. I never kept a log. Yeah. I mean, my logs are literally just what each trip, when it was not even where we went, just what we caught. And I put the sat shot. I take a screenshot of it every day on my phone and just kind of put it in the sheet, in the Excel sheet. And, uh, Finding those common denominators and finding the right variables, whether you're fishing the cold side the entire time, cold side of the break, and you're just following that for miles, which we did this year. We followed it for 50 miles every day. We just kept going west, following the fish in it, or you're fishing the warm side or the back edge, you know, wh- wh- whatever the condition is, just finding that condition and putting those variables together. But also just paying attention to how people are catching a fish and what you need to do to produce. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the advantage of that constantly going and coming is you get to take advantage of those reports, but that also hurts you because you're, you're fishing yesterday's numbers. So you try and put together w- w- those variables that what you caught on yesterday and apply it to today's condition. And sometimes you fall flat on your face, but more often than not, I like to think we, we do okay for ourselves. Yeah. What do you think, Nick? Do you, do you kind of co- connect, do you, do you kind of connect those dots mentally or do you just kind of be like, yeah, this looks good. This is going to be it. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. I, you know, both, I would say, you know, sometimes I show up and it's just like you pull up to that spot and you're like, all right, we're going to, we're going to get him here. Yeah. And other times you kind of pull up to a spot and you might not think you're going to get him, but you kind of have the right, you know, just bait and, you know, a little bit of life. And you're like, all right, well, let's, let's just at least give it 45 minutes or something, see if anything happens. And, you know, sure enough, maybe you start picking out a couple or something. So uh, it's the reasons. Yeah. The reason why I asked is because I feel like, like there's a couple, I feel like there's two in the ocean city. I can kind of put people in the two captains into, or, you know, the captains I look up to in the kind of two different categories. There's the, the scientists who kind of can, you can be like, you can ask him why he's there. And if he's in the mood and wants to explain it to you, he can, he can literally write, write a, you know, a dissertation about why he was there, which way he was going. And then there's another one that I call more like the artists. And they're like, well, you know, I just kind of picked a spot and I kind of knew that we're going to be there You know, (laughs) and they can't, maybe, maybe it's just because they don't really want to care to articulate it or not, but it's, I I find it like, you know, some people can just kind of play and some people kind of got to put it all together, you know? Yeah. And I think sometimes you're fishing, you know, sometimes we're fishing, a structure, you know, or fishing a bottom. And a lot of times we're just fishing a good condition, you know, like a nice clean edge, you know, that is with where there's no structure at all, but you're like, fuck, this is like a little, little highway right here, you know? Yeah. So back and forth. Yeah. But sometimes they're not in any of it and they're in the fucking dirty water where you normally wouldn't fish. So (laughs) you found that and I've seen you catch catch tunas and some catch stuff in some pretty crappy water dean yeah yeah i think that um i think you you can only do the best you can with what you got and you can't catch what's not there but uh it's definitely interesting what you say about the artists Uh, i think that sometimes a fresh approach really helps that the days i sit there where i'll overrun them or it just doesn't work out and then the one lone center console absolutely crushes them and it's like wow (laughs) (laughs) did that really just happen there's (laughs) definitely there's definitely an element of it's a big ocean up here where you know where we me and you do most of our fishing dude and it's definitely and you can be out there and analyze all the stat shots and have half the east coast in your contacts and you can still you know come back and there'll be somebody a weekend guy who just absolutely whacks him and you struggle just because you know it's a big ocean and you can't you can you know it's uh, it's, it's it's 
funny you said uh, earlier when we were talking about the big ice fishing in the tournaments that you know I think the biggest difference in the last six, seven, eight years is the vast amount of boats. How many more boats are out there actually fishing these tournaments? I mean, you look at the entries and the, and the Calcutta money, and there are just so many more boats fishing. And I would say that's the biggest difference is that the information speed is five, six X, 10 X, what it used to be. Yeah, you absolutely. used to be able to get a day or two in a Canyon bite before the world was on you. Now you get four or five hours uh, up home. We might not even get three hours before yeah. 20 or 30 boats are on us. And I mean, it's partly because we're in the information business, but it's also just the advent of technology, the influx of technology with the sat texting. And, and I think that's a big game changer, just having the right information at your fingertips to make the right decision. Mm-hmm. I think that really helps. And I always admired the, some of the other captains and how they had that information speed dial. They could pick up anyone's phone or call any sat phone and say, where do I need to be? Yeah. Boom. All right, let's go. That's a, that's a pretty, it's a pretty, what do I just say? Not like a, an overlooked aspect of, of fishing for somebody maybe that, that doesn't fish professionally. We, I mean, at this point, if we don't understand that we're kind of screwed, but you know, I mean, I love being able to call up, up to you and be like, Hey man, are the white Marlins bothering you yet? Cause I can go up there and find myself having a good day before anybody else kind of wants to go up, up your way, you know, but it's kind of, it's, it's so important to have, you know, I, for these tournaments, I spend a ridiculous amount of time on the phone, you know, for, for the, for the big tournaments or even just, just for a day of fishing, I'd spend an hour or two on the phone every night calling, calling half the East coast. It seems like. I, I, I hear you. And I, I do, I think that's probably one of the, uh, one of the more humbling experiences with the fishing is learning. You can call somebody, you know, someone you looked up to when you were a young mate, you can call them up, you have their cell phone number and they'll tell you. I've I've always thought that was one of the coolest, coolest career developments, professional developments for me to have that, that level of respect. On the flip side, I probably spend two, three, four hours a day just combing through the data between just looking at sat shots and then having the texters going, just different information, just, and even silly information. We might get reports from a Canyon a hundred miles away, but I remember, uh, a day in July, we were getting some information from a canyon. We were 100 miles. It was 100 miles east of us. And the guy's like, yeah, I found all the fish up top in inside the 100. And I was out two, 300 fathoms doing some big eye troll. And I'm like, dude, we should be going inside, inshore. Like, let's go try that. We did find fish there. It was just a weird freak event. But yeah. just even the littlest piece of information that probably has no relevance to you, just to pick up on the next general trend. I used um, to... When I was, when back when the, the fishing forums were a thing, we're right, probably right about when, when me and you both started running, running our perspective, our respective operations, I used to comb through the, the fishing forums to see if any like center console or anything had had like a, had like a good day. And he was like telling everybody what it, where it was not, you know, anymore. You just get on Instagram or Facebook or, you know, you get the texter out and you get, get going, but you know, I, I, Definitely spent a whole whole bunch of time trying to find maybe something that nobody else knew about. Yeah, it's 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 tremendous to have that edge, and it's it's funny because Facebook and Instagram, I think, are some of the best pieces of uh, best pieces of best uh, best information sources mm-hmm. to get the data. Um, you know, days when I'm totally striking out, I wish we had satellite internet on the boat so I could sit there and comb through it. <laughs> yeah. Because I've been on the backside of that where you you, try, you run twenty thirty miles and, and you have a great day. Yeah. Yeah, if, it, if it's not on uh if it's not on instagram it didn't happen <laughs> that, that's true yeah it's gotta be official right <laughs> oh man would you but, say uh, like the pressure of like a lot more i guess boats in general just fishing right now has helped you find fish or would you say sometimes it's just it's too much and there's too much pressure out there sometimes when fishing's consistent you can make do see what's going on now is everyone's just fishing the the best report. Yeah. If you can keep finding that best report, you're fine. It's the days where it's one spot, super spot specific, and everybody's out there that you just don't have the advantage. Um, it, it's it, it's helpful and it's not. You know, the last few years we've seen some great inshore fishing up by us, which give you a little perspective is like a thirty to sixty mile run instead of an eighty to hundred mile run. So we're running through that. So we're able to kind of get. Sometimes we'll go in there in the morning or in the afternoon and top the boxes off or make the whole trip there. So that's helpful. But um, it, the, the crowds have definitely hurt us. Definitely hurt us. Yeah. And, and the days it's really tougher. If you find some fish inshore in the morning or something, you go back out the next day. It's very difficult to get in there because there's so many boats. And now yeah. everybody goes early. There's yeah. no such thing as the charter boats are there an hour earlier or anything like that. Yeah. Everybody knows you want a good tuna fish, you need to be there around first light. Yeah. That's, that's no secret anymore. And that's, and that's just the information flow. Just people are fishing so much more similarly. Everyone has wind on leaders and wind on rods and 
similar techniques. Very few secrets anymore. It yeah. seems like, you know, like there's no, as far as like a technique, especially when it comes to the, maybe the, the, you know, the technical side of rigging or anything like that, it's pretty, pretty standard. Like you pretty much, you know, kind of, you know, somebody's going to always come up with something new, but that ain't going to be a secret for very long. It doesn't seem like so. Unless no, and, just, and, and I don't think you can really do much more now to, yeah. to, cha- to change that. I don't even think if you fish lighter leaders, you're going to get more bites. It's, I think the biggest advent around here with the fishing is going to be, you know, just more efficient fishing. So uh, mm-hmm. like sonar fishing or something where you, someone's just going to be able to make a left turn and know they need to be making that left turn as opposed to somebody like me who doesn't have one and yeah. says, do I go right, left or straight? It just is what it is. And, and that's going to be just a function of a whole lot of money behind a fisherman. Yeah. And that works. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's interesting. Um, I mean, I know like what I was just going to add on to that is like, you know, some guys kind of wait till they get a report. I mean, not just sail fishing, you know, kind of yeah, you know, everywhere. A wahoo or wahoo or when the yellowfin tuna show up across the stream and stuff, you know, a lot of guys kind of wait until they get that good report. But I kind of always like, yeah, like th- that works too. But then sometimes you're chasing the bite and sometimes you just got to go out there and make the report and be the guy that's telling everybody, hey, they're over there, you know? Yeah. I've learned, like, I, I guess when I was younger, I felt like I, I chased, chased the bites of the, my, my heroes a lot, you know, and I finally just through beating my head against the wall and trying to, you know, started to build some confidence and breaking out myself, you know, I'd, I'd be like, I'd look at the spot on the satellite shot and be like, man, that looks fucking good there. And then somebody would end, like end up there at the end of a day and like catch like, you know, have catch a half dozen whites in a blue or something like that in like an hour. Fuck, you know, yeah. I'd, it's a, but then I, I don't know. It's a consequence of, I found it to be a consequence of kind of just the learning curve. You know, I, for a long time, I just didn't feel like I knew what I was looking for, you know? And now I feel like I can, if I'm not in the right spot, I can go and search for what I'm looking. And I'd rather, I'd rather be searching instead of beating my head against the wall, you know, like yeah. with the, with the fleet, you know, there's, yeah, yeah. I guess there's days that you got to kind of fish with the fleet and outfish him, try to outfish him. And then there's other days where, you know, depending on what, what you see in your respective fisheries, you know, what's coming, what's going. I mean, I don't know. I feel like the Canyon runner has always found itself, you know, out there on the front edge, mainly probably because you fish a lot, Dean, would you say? I mean, we go fishing a lot. I think, I think a lot of it also has to do with you. you, When you put it, when you get into a multiple boat situation, you got a lot of competition in there. You got a whole lot of testosterone on one dock. You're going to get some really good fishing out of that. comes a lot of drama as well, but (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, we went a lot and that helps a tremendous yeah. amount. And, um, I, I think that early on in my career, I was afraid to kind of fall on my face. But yeah, me too. A hundred percent. You're like, Oh man, we're going a hundred yards. These people are playing a whole bunch of money, you know? And I was like, I gotta, I gotta, I have to catch something, you know, I'd rather catch something than nothing. And now I'm, I'm far less afraid of that, you know? Yeah. What, yeah. And once I learned how to, how to read the conditions and really get on the edge, really where, where how to, how to thread the knife or thread the needle, mm-hmm. I felt more comfortable with it. And you know, the adage of uh, just because you know, karate doesn't mean, you know, Kung Fu. You know, I think that it takes a learning curve with any great fisherman. And you see it um, over time. And I, th- I think that uh, just takes a little bit of time to just be there, be a part of it. And uh, you, you learn how to not make those same mistakes. Um, I remember reading reports of where I would decide to go to Canyon A and other fishermen to go to Canyon B. And if I had a decent trip, but they had a better trip, I'd sit there and just figure out why and what they saw and what yeah. I didn't. So that I made sure I never mista- made that mistake again. Yeah. But those are gut wrenching days when you know someone's getting them and you're far away. You can't get there. That yeah. sucks. When you, or when you're, or when you're right next to them and they're mowing them right next to you. (laughs) Yeah. But you know what? In that scenario, I've always felt like we carry all the tackle we could possibly carry on the boat. And I know you're, you're fishing more live baits, I'm assuming. So it's probably a little different there, but like, uh, I've always felt like if at least if I was, if I was there, at least I said, I gave it my all. It just didn't happen for me. Yeah. Um, when I'm way out of position, that was the one that crushed me. Yeah. that, That sucks. They both suck, but yeah, that sucks. Like you said, it does, it does. If you are in the right spot, I guess there's nothing you know, there's nothing you do. But it happens. It happens here a lot. I mean, you could be rigor to rigor with a guy catching, you know, fifteen fish, and you catch three. You know, you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> I, I don't. I don't like it when it's like somebody you know and you fish with, like, and you just know that they're not whatever it is they're doing. You know they're doing it, except they're just keyed in on something on the day that that you can't figure out, or for for whatever reason you can't get it going, and that kind of that shit kind of is is a little bit annoying i would say 
you know, but that's oh, no doubt at the end of the day, it's like, you're still like, yeah, I'm, it's fucking fishing. You know, some days like I used to, I used to get completely fucking worked up at myself over, over stuff like that. I look around and I'm like, oh man, it's these, these guys that I know exactly. I fish with them a lot in the summer or something like that. You know exactly what they're doing, but they're just getting them. And I, I guess I found a better way to cope with that. So that fucking getting all frazzled on the bridge and getting in a bad mood, it cloud, it cloud me. And now I can feel like I can work my way through it and, and you know, keep focus and keep fishing and, and have the faith that it's going to happen versus, you know, uh, some days when I was a lot younger, I'd be like, man, it's just not going to happen for us. You know, I'm watching, you know, the bill fishers of the worlds and the Viking Viking boats of the worlds do circles around us. And I'm just like, it's, I don't have it figured out and I'm not going to figure it out. Now I feel like with, with age and a little bit of maturity, only a little bit of maturity, I can kind of, kind of at least feel like I can keep on working through it, you know? You're steadily improving every year. It's, it's always a win. You've been doing well though, man. The last yeah, five years, you've been doing very well. Yeah, we've, yeah, it's been just a learning curve. You know, a, a lot of it helps out with, you know, Pete and the other owner, Bill, they're, they want to go fishing, you know, they're ready, to, ready to rock. And, you know, they let me take a charter here and there when I'm, when I'm kind of in the, in the middle of a stint where they can't fish. And, you know, the rest of it is just the guys and them and, you know, I fish with the same team and Nick knows like, and you know, for bill fishing, you need that group and they bail me out constantly dude I had so many days this year i can't say that i had more bites than anybody else but my guys were on it you know they didn't miss so you know just having that team and being able to go is is a huge thing and i had to be real patient with that because our program didn't start out like that you know so it'd be difficult but that's good you got to have good commodity on the boat at all times got to be in it to win it yeah. I think that's very important. I really I like, do. I feel like if you have people that are going the same direction, you know, you can have your differences, but if you know, you know, you're all pushing that with the same goal in mind, it, it, it certainly helps, but yeah. Been fortunate and now uh, fortunate lately that they've, they've wanted to go fishing, you know, and not that they never wanted to go fishing, but they, they have the time to now, you know, a little more motivated. Yeah. I, I just, just think life is they're in a position in life where they can go, you know, and they're, 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 they're motivated and, and then now they have the time. So fortunate in that aspect. And they learn, let me burn all the fuel. So go up there and hang out, <laughs> hang out with you sometimes. That's perfect. Dean That's on perfect. trips, uh, on some of those, you know, whenever you, I'm sure when you get back to back to back charters and you're doing really well on the tunas, how does it work? Uh, like dividing up the fish is like some go to the boat, some get sold, they all go to the client. How's that work? So really we're just charter fishing. So um, if it's just a full charter, so one one person chartered the boat for their friends or their invite, it's all it all stays to them. Uh, excuse me, all goes to them, all the fish. Um, hang on one second. I'm trying to find my dog here. Um, <laughs> so um, in terms of like sometimes we run the makeup or the open boat charters, and that's when we have to divide the catch up you know, equally, but we got a great clientele on that boat. We don't have any, you know, kind of shady characters on that boat. And, uh, you know, these guys all want to fish. And at the end of the day, Anthony, you brought up a point about, uh, you know, fishing the tournaments and you got to remember that with the charter fishing and they're out there to have fun. They're out there for the day. They don't really know what's being caught around them. If they're having a good time. They're going to be happy and they'll rebook. And that's really what we aim for Yeah. at the end of the day. That's, that's what's a good, most important to us. That's a great point that sometimes they're kind of, they don't know exactly what's be, what's going on. You know, if, if you're getting your ass kicked or not, cause I used to, like I said, I used to let that get into my head and they, they would quickly know about it, you know? <laughs> right. so instead of now i just kind of just keep on pushing keep on keep on fishing instead of being like well we're not catching anything sorry guys <laughs> as long as they have a good time that's that's all that's all we care about it's all i care about now and as i've done it for 13 years now i just as long as they're happy i'm happy i try, yeah. I try not to get too too worried and every day doesn't need to be some glory day yeah keep them happy um, well, I was going to say something to you. Oh, Nick, they charge. What do you, you guys charter charge a day now? I mean, we charge $4,000 a day on the blood money and that's just for a 12 hour trip. So our trips are a list price is going to be right around 6,500 bucks. Yeah, plus a tip. So. yeah. You know, we got a lot of expenses with the fuel and then just the sheer length of our trip. Yeah. We don't, we don't charge more for any distance or if we have to go bait fishing, if we have to put on three, 400 pounds of bait, we don't, we don't charge any more for that. And yeah. I mean, that just is what it is. How is it, you know, you, you guys always, that transition from nighttime, you guys probably do that pretty seamless, seamlessly, but whenever we do an overnighter, it's a complete disaster. Like I <laughs> find like the idea that, you know, going from trolling to 
to to chunking and 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 sword fishing you know it's kind of a being able to change without having a complete disaster or a cockpit has got to be an art to it and it totally sucks but <laughs> <laughs> honestly it's it's really it's a whole new program it's a yeah. whole new outfit of equipment for the boat um we have some parallels um so like uh, the the reels i use on the waybacks right are 70s on um, wind on guide so i'll use those those leaders i'll cut the you know the the heads off there if we're using joe shoots or islanders and i'll just put i'll just crimp the hook on and i'll put my squid on that for my sword rod and for our chunking gear we have uh you know smaller 16s or 30 wides we'll pull those out but it's a lot of equipment and just take your time with it over the years i used to rush you just go nice and easy with it and the fishing's different now too you not every night you're going to go out there it's is the norm you're going to chunk a limited yellowfin i think you know if you do that one to three times a season at night chunking a limited yelp and that's that's what the fishing is yeah um, when i first started on the boat you know middle of august you had a pretty good shot at catching anywhere from a handful to 30 elephants a night it's just not the case anymore do you think that's because there's just more boats out there and the fishing fishing is diluted or do you think the fish is not as good well, there's a rod and reel catches, which I don't think anyone really under knows what's really being caught because it's just not reported for whatever reason. Um, I think if you look at like places like Oregon Inlet, right, that's probably one of the best places to see what a rod and reel catch is going to be. But even then, there's so there's so many of them getting eaten by sharks now that it's hard to hard to even you know you, you got to kind of go with how many how many fish are being eaten and caught. You know? Oh, sure, sure, yeah. sure. But where I was kind of going with that is that I think they're seeing a decline in catches. You know, you talk to the old school fishermen and they say they used to catch yellowfins off moorhead or used to be able to troll limits here or chunk limits here i think by and far there's definitely some uh, behavioral changes migration changes happening to fish in general you see landings of like fluke they're more north and east um you see the shrimp in maine they're further north and east you see the shrimp that were off louisiana and florida south carolina now they're up in north carolina in droves i mean what's up with that in the last five six years yeah we've we've even seen seen bits and bits of them in ocean city now right cobias right i mean yeah. what was it four years ago there was like you know, everyone was catching cobias outside the inlet now yep. all of a sudden you hear a tarpon off newport rhode island and block island so you know i think there's a, a gradual increase north and east of species i don't know if it's off i think um i think you can't ignore the commercial fishing and, mm -hmm. and how many fish are being taken out of the ocean I don't know if it's necessarily the reason that the fish are, are gone, like, or there's less of them. I, I think that the fish redistribute themselves. And yeah. uh, I think they're like humans, right? Like humans will go to a hot city, like Miami, that's the hot city right now. So do we think there's less people in Connecticut? Probably. Yeah. But is, are there less people on this earth? I don't think so. Yeah. The census will probably back that up, but <laughs> that's how I look at it. Um, but I think, I think fishing's always changing. It's always evolving. It's changed so much since I've been in it for the last 10 years. And, and I think it'll continue to do that to uh, change forever in some way. Yeah, yeah. that's changing oh, what do you for think? sure. What do you no, guys think? What do you guys see? It's changing, man. I, I could tell you I've seen in just the last 10 years growing up charter fishing. And now, I mean, it's, it's, it's like the fishing is getting pushed back later and later, and you're just not seeing big pushes of fish like we used to. I mean, we used to, we be catching cobias like crazy right out front in the shallow water on stingrays and that fishery is completely gone. I mean, you never even see one anymore on a stingray and sailfish. I mean, usually, you know, big pushes of sails are coming down December, January is on fire. Mm -hmm. We maybe had one nice push so far and it was for two days and now it's like back to nothing. And usually this time wow. of year is like on fire, but, and then after sailfish season's over, you know, April is pretty much the last tournament and you see, you know, everyone's going to go travel Bahamas. And now it's like May and June are like the two best months for sail fishing in South Florida, which is like, no one's, even, no one's even sail fishing anymore. Nick, do wow. you, do you think in your aspect, you know, you need those big cold fronts to, to push through. Do you think that there's just less of those big cold fronts and to create those conditions that are favorable? Or you just think there's less fish? Cause this is an ocean city this year for me this year and the year before I was like, I'd get out to a spot and I'd be like, it's going to fucking kind of happen here. And it, it was good, but it wasn't like, like what I would equate it to, you know? like 10 years ago. Yeah. No, I, do you I feel like know. that? I, do you feel like there's not that many cold fronts or do you think that there's just less fish <sighs> or, or they've changed, you know? Yeah. I, I don't know. Like Dean said, I don't know, maybe something with their migration pattern or, you know, maybe global warming. I don't know. I mean, but we're just not getting like December used in Miami used to be like a great month of fishing back when I was growing up. Now, like yeah. December is like, it's like, why are you going to go waste your time? Catch one sale in December. It's like, wow. 
it's horrible. Uh, you know, it's, mm. it's weird. Did you notice that Dean? Did you, did you get out to some, some spots, you know, last couple, couple years and maybe notice that, you know, you're seeing everything you should, except the fish aren't there. Or, you know, you feel like you're, you know, you've still the kind of the same. Mm. You know, I, I think that we're fishing the water. We're, or, we're water oriented. And yeah, my, yeah, yeah. my style of fishing is water oriented. Yeah, me too. hundred percent. I think that when the fish are around, I've noticed that when you have blotch, splotches of blue water coming in from the east, it's going to be a decent season overall. Um, 2016, 17, 18, 19. I was just reading through some of my other, my other kind of spreadsheets of the fishing. Um, they were pretty dismal years out there for tuna fishing. Um, and we didn't have the water coming from the east in the big droves. Like it either came from the east and stopped or it just didn't really come at all. Um, so we've had some barren years, but, um, you know, two years ago, we had great bluefin fishing out here in the 30 fathom area. And they just set up here and hung out here for three quarters of the season. Mm-hmm. This year, they were here for a month. I don't think the bluefins are gone anywhere. I just think they set up somewhere differently. But, you know, our, like I said, our fishing is a little more water oriented and, and starkly different. Like right? either it's here or it's not. Yeah, it's yeah. not like the Gulf Stream off North Carolina where it's there no matter what. But, uh, you know, every year is different. Same but different in some capacity. So, you know, some years we've got great bluefin fishing and we don't see the elephants in the canyon or some years we see the elephants in the canyon and no bluefin. Gotcha. Do you feel like, um, do you feel like you're seeing more giant bluefins lately last year or two? Then I've seen more in around like just fucking jumping around out in the oh, ocean. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. A- absolutely. I mean, you look at the quota, the bluefin quotas around the world that are, it, it, let me, let me rephrase around the Atlantic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the amount of weight caught, the tons of fish caught are, are definitely up. I think that you're seeing fish now off Norway and Iceland and um, England and, and Ireland. They haven't seen fish like that in 30 years. Yeah. But uh, I would say the last five years, you know, every bluefin fishery, whether there's some, some action off Morgan Inlet, um, Massachusetts, even locally, um, you're seeing more and more of them. And I also think that you're seeing people target them. Yeah, you know, yeah. No one 10 years ago would want to catch giants on 50 wide. I got you clobbered by them You're white crazy. marlin fishing. It was right. not pretty. Right. It, it's not. <laughs> but I also think you're seeing people earlier in the season be more exploratory and fish yeah, a yeah. thousand fathoms for tunas. You're going to see more inter- interceptions there. Um, there's definitely more bluefins around. And I think that's one of our best fisheries. The inshore yeah. bluefin fishery can be some of the best, best tuna fishing you could you could ever get into. And I think it's perfect for a wreck guy. You catch a couple unders and, and it over. Like, yeah. I mean, what's better than that? You're going out for the day. You know, by, by our standards, it's not have to, tuna fishing. Not have to run 50 or 80, 100 miles and kind of, you can kind of go out there and it's a little bit more, it's just, it's just a little easier in, in almost every way, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the most the most interesting kind of development in the fishing, though, and you brought it up there earlier, was uh, the Oregon Inlet with the sharks. You know, just how bad the sharks were. I was just I did a trip in uh, in January with a couple of buddies. We were in Venice, Louisiana, and we had pretty slow tuna fishing, but the shark fishing there was like the best I've ever seen. We caught twenty five to the boat, which is nuts, chunk of tunas, yeah. and you know just as many shark bite offs. But I was asking the the guy that we were with, and he said that the sharks there are vicious. It's like everywhere, but they eat, eat fishing, the tunas too, or no? Oh yeah, no, they yeah. crush them just like now, the same stuff in Oregon Inlet. When you say sharks, you you were talking about you were get, catching that many makos? No, we were not no. catching makos. We were catching yes. uh, black tip, and I think they call them spinner sharks or reef yeah. sharks. Yeah, yeah, I have tons of those. It's like crazy, crazy. Well, yeah. So I mean, even down here, the shark, the sharks here now are the worst it's ever been. I mean, right when you stop and put the boat in the neutral, there, there's eight you know, 500 pound bull sharks circling the boat, you know, it's ridiculous. Yeah. That's just nuts. That's <laughs> crazy. Chewing on yeah. your engine. That's why I asked about like, or when you were talking about, you know, the catches that those guys in Oregon Inlet, you know, the, the, you know, you don't even know how many, it's been bad there for what, four or five years, like really bad there for at least three or four years that I know of. And it crept up to ocean city this year. I got more, more tunas eaten, which is still not that many compared to those guys, but more tunas eaten by uh, sharks than ever. And uh, I just don't know how many, you know, if you talk about like our impact on the fishery, like, you know, how many do you, you come back with, with a dozen tunas say on a, on a good day, if you can keep a dozen away from the sharks in Oregon Inlet, how many did you, how many did, you, did they, did they, get you know that they don't they don't they're gone you know it's the same it's the same consequence as putting them in the boat you know yeah. other than the sharks eat you know so i find that i find that interesting you know Absolutely. and Absolutely. I, don't, I don't i wouldn't want to i do not envy those guys down there battling what that. sharks what what type of sharks there off oregon inlet i want to say they're like a, a dusky shark like a brown like i've either seen 
like a like a brown shark probably i don't know if they're bull sharks or dusky sharks either like three three four hundred pound brownish sharks um i should know more about this but when i was getting them eaten last year they were big brown they could have been bull sharks or i don't know if bull sharks come up Sam, that far sandbar sharks maybe 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 but they were three two three hundred pounds maybe four hundred pounds um and then i've also had fish eaten by like a like a rabid group of black tips you know like that aren't as big as those those things were massive and they would they would eat a whole tuna themselves where the other another group of smaller black tip size Hyenas. sharks would would come and they they just have at like yeah. one tuna you know six or eight of them so i don't i don't i don't know exactly but i hope it's not a problem this year in ocean city or or in oregon inlet for that matter but i don't i don't yes we'll find out soon dude three yeah, four I, months i don't be fishing i don't i don't think that that's gonna be the case you know <laughs> <laughs> so i mean those guys were talking about having marlins eaten down there so they're just thick there oh yeah no, it's uh it's definitely becoming a problem for sure. Yeah, for sure. Problem. So, buddy, well, you are you're not the full time guy on the Canyon Runner anymore, and that's uh, I res- I think that's cool and kind of sucks because I, I like call having that information that white marlin information from you, <laughs> you know. But <laughs> how, how's it feel? You know, you you just got married, and you know you're you're making some. You you said to me your quote was. You know, you were fortunate enough to to squeeze what you you would consider a, a, a full career in the 13, 14 years, which I can't argue with. You know, you fished, you know, between your your circle of doing Manasquan, North Carolina, and then up to the to the Northeast. You you went hard for a long, long time. And, and how's it feel to kind of be not stepping away, but walk away, stepping stepping back a little bit? It's different. I think it's bittersweet. Um I kind of fulfilled everything that I wanted to with the fishing without really wanting to do anything. (laughs) I never really wanted to run a boat. I never really cared for that sort of recognition. I just did it because I enjoyed the fishing. But, uh, oh, it's a a new chapter. I'm excited for it. Um, Going going back to that, like, I was, I want to ask some of the older guys and I don't ask you too, Nick. Did you ever, like, you know, you see the progression of people in the industry that, you know, you can find a pretty cool job when you get, get kind of done your fishing career still in the industry or something like that, or you use, use your connections in the industry to parlay it into a cool job. But was that ever, did you ever have a master plan or were you just kind of like, I really enjoy this and I'm just going to keep doing it until, till I don't like how, how, how far ahead did you look when you were a younger kid or did you not? Yeah. You talking to me or Nick? Either you, you can go oh. first. You're the guest. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, I never really looked that far ahead. Yeah. Um, it was actually Adam who told me the, the owner of the boat says you need to figure out a goal, dude, with what you want to do with your life. Um, <laughs> kind of ironic, really. It was just like, well, right now it's just running a boat for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, when you're 20 years old, I don't know if necessarily having a goal is the best thing for you to do because you're so focused on the goal. You're not necessarily soaking up everything around you. Yeah. You know, one of the most fascinating parts of being in the fishing industry is that you got a billionaire in a stained t-shirt and you got a guy that's worth nothing in a stained t-shirt having a bar or at the bar, having a beer, just talking, yeah. right? Where does that situation happen anywhere else? I, I have yet to figure that out, yeah. but um, you know, you just don't know who you can meet and you're exactly right. It could parlay into a myriad of things and your network is really what's going to guide you to where you can, what other opportunities you can have. But I never really looked that far down the, down the court, so to speak. I just looked at the next trip and that was yeah. it. And in the middle of your twenties, you, you do okay for yourself. You make enough money. What's, what more can you want? You're having the time of your life. And, and for me, I was just learning something new every day. And I enjoyed that. And I enjoyed the challenge. Yeah. What, what about you, Nick? What, what was, what were your thoughts? I guess we have kind of similar backgrounds in the sense that we've both been fishing for throughout our twenties yeah. and, and teens. Yeah. Well, I mean, I kind of, kind of been in your shoes, what you're kind of doing now. I mean, I, you know, obviously raised and started young doing it and it's kind of all I've ever even thought of dreamed of doing. And just, you know, being at 20 years old, I was like, well, I just want to run a bigger boat than a bigger boat. And, uh, but I did, I did have a two year period where I did step away from fishing completely. And, uh, wow. I, I went Why'd to you golf. do that? Um, just kind of after, after one season, uh, kind of just, I don't know, kind of a weird kind of situation end to a year um on one of the boats and i uh i literally packed my bag and moved to california but i mean in a matter of a month yeah and uh at the time i was like i, I didn't see even see myself coming back you know for a little bit it was kind of a strange uh time in my life i enjoyed california a lot i thought it was a great place uh working out surfing a little bit and uh but came back and you know 
dove right back into it, but it was a, it was a good break. You know, it was, uh, it was nice to change it up and not saying I, I, I couldn't see myself doing like something, doing something like that again. You know, I would never say never, but you know, right now I'm definitely, uh, still mad at him right now. Kind of the way I am. I feel like for me, it was, it was kind of always a goal to build a team. Like I, like the, the only goal for me when I was a young, when, when I was a mate was like, I needed beyond being able to one day be a captain was to kind of build a team, you know, with the kind of people that I wanted to, I didn't think that it was going to be like, this is pretty awesome what I got here, but you know, just kind of build a team team where I could be really competitive and in, in ocean city kind of, and, and then fish other places, but mainly kind of to do this, that was kind of beyond that, like beyond this, I got, I got nothing. So I got to figure it out if, if eventually, if I get to that point, but I, I mean, I, we, I've taken a lot of, we've been fortunate to take and maybe not fortunate, but a lot of our winners have been pretty, pretty relaxed, if not downright dismal. And sometimes I've been able to fish, you know, some other places on some other boats, you know, but, and then really, really appreciate the summer. Cause I can only imagine like, you know, traveling all winter and then coming back to ocean city and going hard there. It could, it could become a, a grind and you could get burnt out where like, I'm not, I'm not to that point. And I could see how hard you, you went Dean, like how, you know, you know, you could say, you know, how old are you, Dean? 35, 34, 35, 33? Two, man. Huh? 32. 32. Like you could, some people would be like, man, you're just getting in the, the prime of your career. And, you know, but you, you, you might at this point kind of be like, you know, I've, I've done everything that I feel like I, I need to, you know, or feel like at least you feel good about it. I don't want to put words in your mouth, you know? Is there, is there any connection I'd say from your fishing experience or past history uh dean that has helped you like maybe lean this direction right now the direction i'm going in um, yeah was it was which is was there is there anybody or you know maybe some somebody you fish with or somebody that kind of helped you maybe go a different route or just maybe just be open to a new idea or it's something kind of you kind of just wanted for yourself truly I, I looked at it and I, I don't think i could ever own my own charter boat and i don't know if i'd ever want to and yeah. uh the types of situations that I found myself in, in some of the private boats, I just felt like it's probably, it's very rare to find someone that I could agree with, like a boat owner that I could agree with to spend real amount of time with. And I never found that in the 13 years I did it or 10 years running a boat, I did it. And so at that point, I just said, it's just time to pivot and uh doing what i'm doing now i just you just try something new it's like fishing you just keep changing it up till uh till you get a bite or till, till it works and yeah. uh i think that's real important to uh just keep reinventing yourself i guess some level i mean i still love the fishing the fishing is never the problem yeah, yeah. And i think with all boat jobs in general it, it the, the toughest part to me was always the boat owner yeah, yeah. um and, and that's just a unique relationship. But uh, Absolutely. So I got lucky. I had a good, good, good relationship. I have a great relationship with Adam. So I, I was good there. And uh, I just wanted to try something different. Really, I, f- I find it hard in my mind to imagine being able to recreate like kind of the, the, the aspects of, you know, if I had, if for some reason the blood money went away tomorrow or, you know, they finally got tired of my shit, which is probably going to happen, you know, (laughs) like, like being able to recreate, having to either rebuild it or recreate it in the same way that I'd be happy with it. You know, it'd be, I'm sure it's possible, but it'd be a rougher, it'd probably be a, a, a rough road and it'd be a not quite it'd be hard to replicate it, you know? So I can kind of get that. I think it's a very tough relationship and I think it has to click, but I think uh, I wrote a couple notes down here. I think the the best boat owners let their own crews and captains solve their own problems. Yeah. And uh, I think it's very hard to find people, owners that really want to do that. At least that I've seen. Yeah. Um, yeah I could see that. Cause you know, they, they're guys and they're really good at what they do typically. And then it's hard, I guess maybe it might be difficult to, to, you know, assume that you're not really, you, you don't know a lot about this, you know, and it's, you know, and it, and it, and you own the the boat. So it's kind of like, you got to have your input and yeah, I could see how it could be. It's, it's different. I mean, I've been with my guys for 10 years now and it's, we've had a, it's been a, it's been a great road, but it's like, you know, it hasn't always been smooth, you know, and it's taught, it's took a lot for me. I think it's taken a lot of time for me to earn, earn their trust to, just be it. They now they're just like, yeah, just call us when the boat's there or whatever, you know? Yeah. So absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, uh, I think you have very su- super successful people. And I, I think a captain's also one of the few people that ever tells a very super successful person. No. Yeah. And I think that's a really hard subject until, till the swallow for some people. Yeah. I think you gotta be willing to back that up with some logic and the, the boats are worth a lot of money. And uh, I think some people do have a tough time letting go, but 
that was where that was my whole thought process on it. And uh, I, I can appreciate that, man. I think that's yeah. like a similar thing. Like you had such a good ride with Adam and the Canyon Runner. It's like you know, where else are you going to go? That's going to give you, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've earned a lot of, a lot of control over the operation with Adam, you know, I'm sure he's, you know, over, over the years kind of given you more and more responsibility if you were willing to take it, and, you know, to be able and, and decision-making power and to be able, you know, to have to go back into that, uh, go back into that, you know, delve back into that pool and try to find a, another relationship like that. That's, you know, it's, it's probably not going to happen. You know, it's kind of where I'm at with this, this group, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to do, but you know, I'm not completely done with it. I'm still involved. We got another captain coming on board, so he's going to, I'm going to help him with that transition. And uh, we're doing a lot of work with that membership service. We have the fishing coach service. So kind of transferring a business from fishing to information based. Yeah. And uh, so that takes a lot of time and I'll do some trips with those guys with our members and I'll get my time in on the water. Yeah. How about you, Nick? Do you feel like, I mean, it's a, it's not an easy relationship, the boat owner captain relationship. Yeah. Yeah, I I think I've, yeah. I mean, over the past however many years, I've definitely worked for a handful of handful of people, a lot of different people, a lot of personalities. And uh, it's definitely hard to find a good balance between the owner and captain for sure. Yeah. It's not, they're not everywhere. It's, I mean, it's hard to find a good captain. It's hard to find a good owner. Yeah. And the, at least the, that worked well together. Yeah. I mean, some, some, you see some situations on the dock or whatever, and you're like, you know, that's, you're like, oh man, those are both great guys. They just, they don't work out together, but then they move on to the next captain and the next job and it, it works out, but it's just not a, either. I, I feel like it clicks right away or it doesn't, you know, like I was it's pretty, pretty, I felt like I was in a good spot as soon as I hopped on this boat, you know? Yeah. So that's awesome. It's 10 years down the road. I sometimes wonder if they, you know, they've had their doubts about me. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. You they're hard on yourself, happy dude. About it. Yeah. I'm sure they're You're stoked about it now. Spot. Yeah. Um, that's pretty cool. Dean. I just, Oh, we got to do our question. The only real question we have, like, is like, we have a day or maybe a couple of days that were like in your mind that they don't necessarily have to be the best fishing day, but like, you know, like reasons why you get out of bed and, I don't, I mean, you don't even go to bed. So I don't like, you know, during the season, why like a, a day that you're like, man, this is why I do it. You know, like maybe it might be an incredible day fishing, but it might not be. It might be something else that, that is cool. You know, that's a tough question to ask, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're, 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 we're heavy hitters here, dude. We're, we're, yeah, we're you guys me and, are big, big timers me, here. A lot of, a lot of money won on this podcast here. Me, guys here. me and, uh, me and Nick are go, getting into journalism actually. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only one wearing the glasses though. <laughs> Isn't that a prerequisite? Uh, uh, no, I got mine. They're just off right now. <laughs> I'm in the context these days. Um, you know, I, I don't think that there's any one day that solidifies it for me. I, yeah. I think there's a certain feeling that everybody that runs a boat or works on a boat enjoys being in the outdoors and enjoys the passion, whether it's the salt there on your face, the wind on the sun on your face, uh, you know, the taste in your mouth, uh, sunglasses on. I, I couldn't explain that for you, but I, I do believe that there's a common bond with any, every waterman on the, on the world, in the world. Um, I think that's probably what summed it up for me to got me up because I was just motivated. Yeah. I liked it. Um, I wanted to be there. And I think that's three quarters of the battle for anybody. Um, you got to want to be where you are. Yeah. If you're not going to, you if you're not motivated to be here, this is going to be as awesome as this is. If you're not motivated to be here, it's a fucking hell, you know? Yeah. I, I remember I was doing a delivery to, to Mexico with a buddy of mine and, and, and he was like, we're just taking a boat to North Carolina. He was like, you know, dude, there's no do overs in life. And I was like, yeah, dude, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> there aren't. And it's just, I think it's too short to be miserable. And if you don't like something, just figure out what you like and go yeah. do it. Yeah. But don't complain about it because I can't stand that. I hate people that <laughs> complain over something like that. But well, that's what motivated me. I mean, and and then you know you get the 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 great catches or the great memories. I mean, that's all we're making is really memories. And I yeah. and I say that all the time. We're making memories turn by turn because that's that's what we're doing. You get the big fish photos. If you're lucky enough, you get to stand there with a big check and a little check, or you get to meet friends. I mean, I think that's one of the aspects that I never really ever thought of until probably the last five, six years is that I've got some great relationships and friends I built in this industry mm-hmm. and um, very few people can share that except for people in the industry yeah, and really I, understand it's like a big frat. It's like a, it's like a fraternal experience. Yeah. I think it's kind of cool. Cause like, I wouldn't say that I like, we're, 
we're buddies, but we're not like friends or anything, but I can, we can, I can call you and we can talk for as long as we feel like talking, you know, honestly. And now Nick, knowing you, I feel like it's kind of like you, you don't really know the person, but you, you know enough about them through the, through the world, through the internet and through, through people that know somebody, then you, you actually meet them and you're like, Oh man, like you could easily be friends with somebody for like a, a long time without really knowing them, you know, have a good bond, you know, without really like knowing them for a long time. I think that's, a- that is cool. Absolutely. And I, and I feel like, you know, if I was ever jammed up in a port, I could make a couple phone calls and get fixed up right away yeah. because of the people in my network. And I always thought that was a really <laughs> interesting sort of ancillary tie to the whole fishing, yeah, sport fishing world. Yeah. About the great connections. <clears throat> yeah, I've been, I've been pestering Rich Barrett every freaking five seconds about this, this Dominican trip. And he's, he's been nice to me, man. He's, he puts up with me. So that guy knows his stuff, man. Dude, and, he's, uh, he's the legendary fisherman. Yeah. He's the nicest guy. And yeah, so, he's a man. so glad that I got, got the, got to know him somehow. He just started talking to me one day, so, but yeah, I think it's, it's cool to be able to go places and be like, fuck and, and know somebody that knows somebody or something like that. Yeah. So cool, buddy. Well, I think, I don't know. We've gotten to some deep philosophical stuff this, this, this go around. So I don't know how it's going to be received, but I really enjoyed the conversation with you guys. I think it's, you know, we're yeah, all, it was, it was awesome. Relatively it, Dean. young guys and kind of at different stages, you know? So I think it's cool. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I appreciate the invite on and I hope you guys will have me back at some point. Absolutely, buddy. Yeah, can, absolutely, man. Um, just as long as I don't have to pay for my white Marlin information, please. <laughs> No, I'll just, get you rigged up, just, dude. <laughs> just let me know when they're up there. <laughs> Which is the funniest thing, because when you would call me about white marlin, I, I was sitting there going, Mike, can you believe this guy wants to talk about white marlin? Yeah. You would, <laughs> I don't you even would... go backwards when I see him. I don't even, no, you don't I don't even... even look backwards when I see the rigger twitch. <laughs> but when I think when, like one day somebody was like, because I knew that about you before. I think the first day I ever called you, I was like, man, like I, I got your number from somebody. I heard that you had seen like a dozen white marlins or something like that up there. And I was like, man, like I, that it looks like the water that they should be in. And I was like, then I got real excited because somebody told me, then you called, then I called you and you were, you were kind of like, you weren't even that bothered by it. And I was like asking you all these different questions about was the bait under, like, was there grass, was there bait under the grass and stuff like that? And, and you were like, yo, that, that's pretty much it. <laughs> I was like, dude, leave me, leave me alone. We went up there and we fucked them up, dude. And we were up there two days later and we caught a, Caught ten and uh, a lot, a lot of long fins and yellow fins too. So, but yeah, I will. I don't. I don't. Uh, I love tuna fishing, but I love my marlin fishing even more. So, I appreciate <laughs> appreciate the northern help, buddy. Because no, I, I feel like when the when the good fishing happens in Ocean City, you can kind of see it taking shape up there, and then it slides down our way. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Nice. Well, thanks, Dan. We thanks, uh, Dean. Appreciate, we appreciate it. Appreciate it. Wish uh, you all the best. Thanks, Anthony.